Now, I'd like to pick up a couple threads then also from uh, where we left off the conversation last. So I noticed when I was reviewing things that I hadn't uh, put a lot of stress on the particular Bible passages that I associated with Nietzsche and also with Descartes. So for Descartes, I had put in Psalm 24 there. And because of the press of time, I just want to apologize that I didn't specifically talk about the psalm. But you'll notice that that's one of the psalms that begins that creation belongs to the Lord. And that's an exact counterpoint to Descartes talking about how we want to control nature. You would also find that just a, a terrific section of scripture to be praying for and praying maybe with people who think that their job as researchers, perhaps MDs or um, whatever, that their job is to manipulate nature, especially human nature. So that psalm is just, well, a godsend <laughs> for those discussions and for our concerns about that. And then I also wanted to mention in, in parallel with Nietzsche. So I think I made the case that Nietzsche is, is somebody who suffered a great deal during his life. So he had enough pain to make you cry when you're reading his biography or uh, the biographies about him. But also the, the suffering where he was trying to figure out how, how to address this. So in, in my writing and my lectures on the problem of suffering, I've pointed out that all human beings suffer. Suffering is part of our human condition. Efforts by uh, thinkers such as uh, Descartes, or such as, I guess, popular notions of medicine today, that, that we can be cured of everything, uh, simply is not true. We do all experience it, though. And even though in America, we seem dead set on denying suffering, put it over in the corner, say it doesn't really exist, let's not talk about it too much, even in church sometimes, right? Uh, it remains persistent. That's what it means to be part of the human condition. So what I can't find any indication that Nietzsche took account of, and therefore something that nobody apparently ever brought up to him, is to begin with those Psalms of Lament that I mentioned yesterday. This is extraordinarily important. I think we pastors sense this. Something in our, our growing up and training generally has not alerted us to those has not, I'm saying by and large, and has not taught us to be praying those psalms with people who are suffering so that Christ can do his work in the midst of suffering. But the passage I put in there is from Philippians 3. So I did mention this passage yesterday, but I didn't connect it uh, clearly with Nietzsche's problem. So in Philippians 3, that's where we have St. Paul talking about um, how he longs to depart and so forth. He's thinking all of this. But then he says um, that he wants to participate in, quote, the fellowship of Christ's suffering. That's that word fellowship again that we were talking about in regard to language, the koinonia. That, that particular phrase is, is sort of glossed over in most of our contemporary translations. Just by the way, as the word evil is in the Old Testament. Some Bibles actually say that that Job had problems. <laughs> but, but actually, in the last chapter, it says that his friends comforted him for all the ra, all the evil that God had brought on him, all the suffering, right? Okay, so in, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, which we, we absolutely glorify for chapter 2, rightly so, after getting that focus on Christ as the two natures in the one person, the humiliation, the exaltation, every knee will bow. Paul gives us what I think you could call kind of the personal application of that for all of us. And that's, I long to participate in the fellowship of his sufferings. That's the main thing. Um, so I, I wonder, and I, I know that this is not going to help Nietzsche at this point, but I wonder what would have happened if somebody had unpacked Philippians for him. Philippians, I, as far as I can see, is not a book he ref references. He does, by the way, allude to the suffering service in, servant in Isaiah a little bit, kind of like, I think, a general piece of knowledge. And the Psalms of Lament seem to be lacking in his repertoire. And I, I would say then that 
um, in light of Philippians 3, every time that we talk about fellowship, just as we can talk about fellowship based on language, the fellowship with Christ is established through the language of the Logos himself, right? And it doesn't happen without suffering. This works beautifully for pastoral care. It is. The, it's the heart of pastoral care, don't you think? Yeah. So yeah. Um, in my previous church, for a few years, we had a lot of people getting sick a lot. And I was at the local hospital so much that one day they pulled me aside and gave me a badge. A photo, and yeah. I had to sign their big thing and everything. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, I started using this passage with people who were really in extreme suffering and to some degree despair over it. Uh, and sometimes it was a couple more visits before it seems to have sunk in, and sometimes it was immediate, but there was always this sense of relief. And I would tell them, where is Jesus right now? Yes. And the answer is, for you, he is on the cross, suffering beside you. And this is your cross on which you are suffering beside him. It is this the cross that will save you. And I never had that misfortune. Yeah. So I can uh, supplement that. First of all, it the the folks in the hospital should be giving ID tags to all the Lutheran pastors. But then we Lutheran pastors have to be bringing the comfort of Christ and not you know, pablum or dodging the issue or that sort of thing. So scripture, obviously scripture in Christ. Um, the, the uh, uh, I guess my way of putting it is, is a little bit more, well, philosophical, but may help too. So suffering uh, happens to everyone, believer and unbeliever alike, but suffering is not self-interpreting. So it's a bit of honesty to say we all suffer, and we Americans are probably the most dishonest about that, that first stage question. But we, we, as Christians, and especially Lutheran Christians, we have the response as to why. It's because God is visiting this suffering on you. Who is this God to do that? Ah, this is the God who suffered for us all. This is the suffering servant of Isaiah. This is the crucified one of all the scriptures. This is the, this is the God who does not stay at high altitude and, and drop pain and suffering on us and then leave like some careless uh, bomber pilot. By the way, there aren't any that, you know, but uh, he's the one who is in the trenches with us. That's why he took on flesh and blood to suffer and then as soon as possible to that passage from Philippians and the praying of those Psalms of Lament. I have a question about uh, the suffering in general as well. And the Philippians passage, I think, is, is really um, um, idiosyncratic in that it's, it's to the individual. But I think that, the, in other words, it's God in the individual. And I'm, I've, I've been concerned that that in America, we have this idea of seeing Jesus, and we don't have a real strong view of the church, as this is actually the fellowship. But do we, 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 you know, uh, um, we bear one another's burdens, of course, as we're told. Um, but is, is there a sharing? We're not just sharing in the suffering of Christ, but we're sharing in each other's suffering as well, if we're in fact church, right? I mean, we're the body of Christ. Yes. So one one part of the body can't suffer without the whole body suffering. Right. I would guess that that Jane will back me up on this with his use of some uh, of, of Philippians three two. But then, which we want to do is uh, recognize the intimate uh, confession that the apostles making in there. But that word fellowship automatically broadens it out. So, but then, but then there's an emphasis too, isn't it? The first thing is the vertical fellowship established by Christ because of the incarnation, all that stuff. And then inevitably, and that's a, that's a recognized cruciform pattern, isn't it? Right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't have the vertical straight, you're not going to be able to do the horizontal. So our 
our confusion today is, first of all, I suppose people don't really want fellowship with each other. But um, that, that is a, a kind of a dehumanizing environment. And the only way to fix that is by establishing the vertical fellowship by virtue of the means of grace, nisi per verbum, only through the word. And, and you know, one of the one of the things that I've tried to emphasize for the lay leaders, especially elders or deacons, is you need to be there, not just me, because you are in that person's fellowship and they, are, and they need you. Um, and I, I can't begin to tell you how gratifying it is to walk out of a hospital room and have parishioners waiting in the corridor for them, or to walk in and see them all even saying, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like, this is what the body of Christ is, <clears throat> is supposed to be. Yes, and I, I'm going to go ahead and, and just add to this. Feel free to, to tell me I'm not doing it quite right. But the, the emphasis here has to be not on the community, but on the Lord who is communing with us. Yeah? So otherwise we slip into all sorts of, of nonsense. Yeah, nice people. And we are nice people, but, you know, so that's, that's quite indispensable. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say, I think that you can't do what we're just acknowledging to be the heart and core of pastoral care. You can't do that without the Psalms of Lament. You know, because we're, we're always looking, I think, you know, any pastor worth his salt and then any congregation supporting their faithful confessional pastor, they're always asking, how do you connect this? So we get these wonderful sermons, right? We get terrific catechesis. But then how does this connect with people day to day and, and in their lives outside of church? And the answer is, it's again, nisi per verbum. It's only through the word, but it is especially when people are suffering. So we should probably have, you know, some kind of a SEAL team response unit or, or you've got your go bag packed. If the call comes or if you hear that somebody is suffering in the hospital or hospice or, or otherwise, and you grab your Bible and you grab your communion kit and if necessary, you grab your um, baptism stuff <laughs> and you get over there. And you pray these Psalms of Lament and teach our folks how to pray them and share them with one another. Um, as I hinted earlier this week, that was the big discovery from COVID, wasn't it? It wasn't just our lackadaisical attitude toward the Constitution, which was pitiful. But it, it was on the part of the church. We failed to do what the church is supposed to be doing, which is not, if you understand me, I don't mean to be, to be um, brusque about this, but it's not generic evangelism, it is to minister to people who are suffering. We're the only people who can really do that, we Christians. And we Lutherans, because of our obsession with the means of grace, we're the folks who are, are should be leading, you know, like the Rangers, we should be leading the way on that. And our failure to do so shows that we're failing to be Lutherans. So that we've got a lot of repenting to do there. Mm -hmm. um. Not that I disagree with any of that, yeah. Um, but the flip side of the coin with the people who are suffering and dying is one of the things with the lockdown. There, there's a force of suffering in silence by yourself in isolation, not wanting to have anyone to be there with your suffering. And I think that that's also beyond the lockdown. That's that that's a wall to break down as well as that people will hide their sufferings and don't want you to be involved. In fact, you being involved will cause them initially more suffering until they, until it does help them. That's how isolated and I guess safe, you know, everyone's just a singular unit in our culture. You know? Yes. So um, the point's well taken. It's a very caring point. And here's my response to that. What that gives away is, number one, that we didn't train people to start with. We were not using the Psalms of Lament and preaching well, maybe not much at all, about suffering being, being a hallmark of things. Do you know that I... I think I think this is correct. Um, 
uh, Ron Ritker's book, The Reformation of Suffering, would give you the footnotes on this. But I think up until the second generation after, of Lutheran pastors after Luther's death, the way that the congregations determined whether a pastor was fit to be called and installed as a pastor was whether he could address suffering. Just as I heard, and I don't know that this is true, and I don't, I don't want to distract too much here, but I heard that as, uh, as recently as about the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, that Lutheran pastors were vetted for service in the congregation by whether or not they had memorized the Psalms. And therefore, inevitably knew the Psalms of Lament, which make up a third of those 150 Psalms. Um, so we, there's a failure there which came to light in that. I think, too, I, I can go ahead and say this. You've doubtless had your conversations, maybe even conferences about it out here. But I spoke um, before things blew up there. I was uh, uh, invited kind of regularly to speak to the pastors in the district, especially the circuit pastors, and talk about um, what we needed to do as pastors. And I, I can report that uh, talking with the brethren in between the sessions that I was presenting from Scripture and about the suffering stuff, in between the sessions, um, there were quite a number of the brethren who came up to me and very quietly said, um, I, am, I am sure that I need confession and absolution for what I failed to do during the COVID lockdowns. Now, first, this is a good thing to hear that we're, we're realizing it, but we did fail. So whether it meant um, getting arrested or not. It bothers the daylights out of me that the only pastor I really, really remember hearing speak out was um, MacArthur from California. And he's, he's the one who said, well, you know, he said, I've done every kind of ministry so far except prison ministry. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go and visit my people. And if I get arrested, I get arrested. You know, I think we're recognizing, I hope, afterwards that we should have been doing that. So that the, the thing is, um, we were ill-prepared. We haven't been learning, preaching, catechizing this at all well. So we need to fix it. If we haven't been at that work now, we are also in an extra dangerous area. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead, and too, and tuck in this thought. As I believe Ritker suggests in his book, um, especially the conclusion. By the way, I wrote a Logia article about that, so you can can get at that on, under the topic of suffering. I think it was one of the Nisi Per Verbum ones. Um, what what uh, Ritkers pointed out was that our failure to teach people that suffering comes from God, and then that that this is part of the fellowship. I'm paraphrasing it, but this is part of the fellowship in Christ, right? Our failure to teach that in modern Christian churches, modern as in what we've been talking about since 17 or 1800 especially, may be the reason for physician-assisted suicide taking off. We're supposed to be the places, you know, if our signs say anything or our websites say, um, they say um, when you're suffering, we're the people who can teach you what that means and how to suffer in Christ. And when you're dying, we can teach you how to suffer and die in Christ so that you'll be with him in heaven. And think of all the other ditzy stuff we put up on our signs and our website. Okay, so that, that's another topic. I understand that. But I wanted to mention that because the Nietzsche piece is very important for that reason. So Nietzsche is kind of giving the spirit of the age after the death of God. And at the same time, he's kind of prophesying what things are going to look like in the 20th century, that people are going to feel they have to exercise their strong will to overcome suffering, that, that they're going to have to seek out some meaning of their own or from some other strong artistic, uh, strong writer, some uh, preacher who's preaching something mightily but not God's word, you know, and, and get through this. That shows up in our vocabulary too, right? Um, how long have you been fighting cancer? Uh, I've even gotten tisk tisked when I said, well, that's not the right way to say it. Right? Actually, the question might be, how long have you been suffering from cancer? Fighting implies that, that we can and should work to overcome this whole business. 
but that in in the in the last analysis that never works you know so as i said i know i'm on a different topic there but uh, please put that in in your thinking all replied but what i was just sitting say you know on different people that i go see uh, in the pastor's absence uh, they'll divulge things but sadly to say, the first thing that comes out of that mouth is, I'm telling you this, but I don't want you to tell him this. And I'm just wondering, well, why would you want me? You're sharing your sufferings now with me. Why wouldn't you want me to go and share these sufferings with your shepherd, your under shepherd, so that then that he can share those sufferings with you and help guide you along? Yes. Yes. Biblically. Right. What are you afraid of? I mean, are you afraid of the man that's representing God in this place? Or do you not care for the man in this? You know, so in the essence, the tiny hands. Yes. Yeah. Well, let, let me think out loud about that for just a second or a minute. So um, to begin, I think that our default position, I don't know that this is unique to Lutherans, but it certainly does apply to us. Our default philosophy of life is Stoicism. So, um, uh, just for instance, I, I had a um, privilege to do, I don't know if, if the brethren out there are keeping track of this, but my, my longest Bible class ever was somewhere between a year and a half and two and a half years long. It was a study of Job. And we went through the book verse by verse every Sunday. Uh, and there was, there was one saint in the congregation uh, who came up to me at one point and I, and, uh, and I had been talking about how Job called out and how this was part of lamenting actually. And it, it's not a wrong thing. The Psalms teach us this is the thing to do. Cry out to God. That's what Jesus did to his Holy Father on the cross from Psalm 22, right? Uh, and this woman came up to me. Now, I'm going to mention also that she was a very dear person and I knew that she wasn't a touchy-feely individual so we shook hands at the door after the sermons and everything and but there were there was never going to be a hugging moment there with anybody in church uh she came over to me though and she patted my arm and that felt that felt just like she was grabbing me and she said well pastor uh, i didn't tell you but my husband and i had a child who died three days after she was born and i've always wondered when I see her in heaven, is she still going to be a baby so I can hold her? Or is she going to be a grown woman that, that I'll be singing with around the throne? And she said, but I thought I, I wasn't supposed to ask those questions. So um, somehow this dear soul had gotten the idea that you're, you're supposed to suck it up when it comes to suffering. Yeah. And we're not talking about some kind of psychological release. We're talking about people saying, honestly, this is what's on my heart and mind. This was how I feel about. It. Now, the second part of this, this is more difficult and you'd be entitled to a longer conversation, but I'm not going to cultivate it here this morning. The other thing that, that we have generally failed to do is we have not made it clear that when suffering happens to a believer, that suffering is caused by God, by, by his his direct personal will. So Luther, as you remember, said, um, don't pray the petition, deliver us from evil unless you're ready to die today. Because God delivers us from evil by taking us to be with him in heaven. And I, I'm not aware that Luther ever said this, but when you say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you're saying, Lord, make me suffer as you see fit. Does it say in Hebrews that um, the one who hasn't been chastened is the son? Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, and I'd like to give you one reference. So if you're feeling a little hesitant, and as I just said, I really can't give the decent discussion on this today. But the thing to check out is Luther's commentary on Psalm 6. Luther's commentary on Psalm 6. So Psalm 6 is an early psalm of lamentation. And... Uh, it's written by David. So in his uh, commentary on that psalm, one of his commentaries, Luther says, um, this is what the prophet is showing us here. Now he's talking about David as a prophet. This is what the prophet is showing us. 
that when we suffer, we must accept that suffering coming from God. Whether it's from the devil or the world, you must acknowledge that it's primarily from God. We learn that, by the way, from Job. So the concluding chapter, 42, down around verse 10 or 11, um, Job was comforted for all the evil that the Lord had done to him. Job was absolutely right to continue calling out to the Lord through all those chapters of conversation with his friends, mm -hmm. right? But we generally don't make that clear. I think as pastors, we probably haven't been taught that very well. I would also offer the thought we may not be reading the Psalms, and we may also not be reading Luther's commentaries on the Psalms, which can help us catch up to what we should have learned along the way very often. So I think if you put those two things together, that's probably what the parishioner is feeling from her sickbed, right? But then the thing is, is for us, um, I, I think, I think what uh, our brother was saying here is, uh, let's just just agree. It doesn't matter in a way who's going to do it, but somebody has to bring the word about the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, and somebody has to share the Psalms of lament. And so, if that's you, you know, pastors out of town, whatever, just got to do it. And it's a good thing, but it also is our primary responsibility as pastors for what we uh, pastors talk about as pastoral care. We, we just simply have to do that. John, you got a question? We can, well, I'll make this the last one. That yeah. is, uh, Psalm 6 was historically used prior to executions in England. Is that so? Read prior to the... Edward oh. doing his thing. Well, thank you, first of all, for that cheery note. <laughs> and then and then especially for that appropriate note. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for that. So uh I've I've I say I, I've doing so many visits, I so often heard why am I still here? Mm. Why am I still here? And I, I finally got to the point where I said, the, the more you complain about it, the longer it'll keep you. <laughs> <laughs> and then the actual game. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> yeah, you haven't learned the lesson yet. <laughs> I, think, I think that's really, uh, if it, I don't know, maybe we're born to do better on this or what? I mean, because we, we, one of the concerns I had yesterday in some of the conversation is this idea that we're in a we're obviously in a battle the scripture says this right but Satan goes about this roaring lion and we we're, we're bad things are happening here but um it's not like god hasn't already won it's it's not like what what, what is i don't know who said it that satan is god's satan and so you know the judge too what's that mm -hmm. Luther was okay. So, but but then you know, and, and Job as well. You it's, it's you get the it's the first chapter. It's like I put up my people. I say, you know, it's it's really interesting. Satan does all this stuff to 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 um, to uh, Job. So so you know, it's really Satan is really bad, right? And, but no, it's like God calls all the angels and he says to Satan, yes. "Have you considered my servant Job?" And I just want to say, God, please don't say that. If you consider my servant Christopher, don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> but the truth right. is, God will do that. St. Paul's, St. Paul's, St. Paul's answer is, Brother Christopher, pray for this. And I, I say that importantly right now, but I, my comments should be taken in a, in a kind of specific sense. My concern is what you might call the, the real life suffering in the midst of things. So when we talk about Christ's victory, that is very important. But in some sense, you need this, this, this extra personal care of the Psalms of Lament to see how Christ is involving you in his suffering, right? Now. Right. Yeah. So um, I would just offer that thought. My, my concern was really this idea that Satan and God are having a battle and that it's a question as to who's going to win. And of course, you know, God is the one who's in control and does the yes. thing happens to your life that God yeah, doesn't right. allow it send. And that's, that's really important because otherwise here you, you have a skewed idea. Of what... Yeah. So you just use the, you just use the word allow. That's what the brethren usually go to in our talking about this, but we, I can say this. 
he sends it. God visits that suffering upon us. And that's, that's mission critical for the comfort of the gospel. It's not, it's not Satan having his way with us temporarily. It's not something random. There's no comfort to be had in that stuff at all. This is your Lord doing this. And then you have to make Jesus large. You have to make the God of the Bible large, just like we do when we're comforting a, a mother or comforting a couple after a stillbirth, right? Why? How come? And the, the remedy, or at least the pastoral care for that, is to make God's mercy as big and great and, and absolutely certain as it is, and not to try to answer questions on a basis of our own IQ or something we've picked up from a Hallmark card, right? Here it is, God's doing that. We're, we're always in God's hands. But look at those hands. Look at those nail prints, right? And this is part of, part of how he's bringing us into himself and unto heaven. Okay, I'm, I'm going to um, move away from that to my sign stuff <laughs> for this morning. So I, I, along with you, I was uh, thoroughly benefiting from the sermon in in chapel this morning, um, still thinking about that that term. Was it? Did you use machine of atonement just, machine? Atonement, atonement machine. Yeah. So uh, I'd I'd like to say something in support of that, based on our classwork here together. Logos. So, what is the purpose of language? What's the purpose of the gift of language? Can we can we see something very essential in there? So we've, we've got the reality that this is what it is because of Christ, the Logos. But, but what's, the, what's the central purpose? And I'm going to go ahead and, and recommend that the central purpose of Logos is always justification. But you're, you're nodding to only half of what I'm going to say. So I think that the, the gift of language um, allows and encourages us always to be thinking in terms of justification. But apart from Christ and the gospel, it's always going to be self-justification. Now, if you think about how, how we do use language we're, when we're in a tight spot or we're, um, well, how often don't we find that we're just trying to justify ourselves, right? So apart from the justification of scripture, it's logos is going to be primarily used for the purpose of getting me off the hook. Of, of making my actions look defensible or reasonable, of being sure that I'm not held to account for my sinfulness and my sins, but it's, it's somehow diffused. Even as, as Christians, we fall into doing that, you know, when we're, when we're not being scriptural. But once the justification is announced, and here's Paul again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What kind of faith? The, the faith in God's universal justification, right? So once you have that, it still remains the case that Logos is entirely for the purpose of justification, but it's now for the purpose of sharing, declaring, establishing the fellowship through God's means of grace with God for everybody that we talk with and speak to and write for, yeah? So logos is about justification. One more kind of layer in there. Um, I think that this is, is the um, ground for what we used to call the understanding of ad aequatio. And it does, it does work out to pretty much the way the Latin sounds. Our adequateness or our fittedness, and in this case, our fittedness for not just learning and knowing and coming to see something, but our fittedness for God to be able to work on us through his means of grace. This is a, a just a little tinge of what Luther is. It really has in mind when he says, um, what's the difference between all of you in the congregation today and a mule? <laughs> well, I could preach to the mule till I'm blue in the face and it's not going to have any effect. And you get the feeling he's about to say, half of you are acting like mules, you know. But he goes on to say, however, you are human beings. This has a lot to do with that, uh, the, the uh, 1536 disputation, what is man, right? So um, this is a big deal. 
So we have been created in such a way, we even talked about this in connection with the image of God recorded in Genesis. We've been made in this logos way so that God can interface with us. That's how he's chosen this. So on both sides, it's not that we can save ourselves. It's not that we can go out there and get this justification. But even in our fallen state, God has been so merciful and is evidencing this plan from before the creation of the world to save human beings and to, to emphasize that he is not willing that any single soul should perish, right? He's kept us in such a way that, that our creatureliness is fitted for the word, fitted for Christ to return to us and make us return to him. I get the, the voice of conscience playing in this. Yeah, thanks. Um, is it okay if I just give you a, a, a reference for thought on that? So um, conscience is another way of talking about consciousness. So I don't think folks in this room would mistake this, but, you know, it does happen pretty often that people have the idea that conscience is some particular little region of your brain or your mind, but that's not the case. It's all of consciousness and conscience just tosses the skio in there because it's a way of knowing something, a particular way of knowing something. So, um, alas, I have, I have a book to recommend. <laughs> which I wrote, that's the alas part. But, but my book, Wednesday's Child, is a study of angst. It is mostly a philosophical study, but it's a philosophical study in service to um, looking deeper at conscience in scripture and actually deeper in our, into our emotions and how God uses those and reshapes them. So the chapter one is about conscience. And I recommend that this, this disquiet we talked about in light of, of the quote from Augustine, how people are always anxious and not at rest unless and until we have Christ, right? That he gives rest to our hearts. That, the, the uh, way of talking about that, that upset, that disquiet is angst in modern vocabulary from the last couple centuries. So I, I recommend that actually, bless you, even though many people um, Thomas Aquinas, for instance, even though many people teach that conscience is like a judge that's operating in your mind, um, I think it's it's more more accurate to say that conscience is this angst upset. So when Paul says about the Gentiles, their thoughts now accusing them, now defending them, I don't think it's necessary to say that Paul is talking about particular propositions or doctrines colliding, but this feeling of angst. So sometimes they feel a bit more at rest. Other times they're terribly upset, anxious, angst-ridden. And that, that may have to do then um, with the foundation for conscience. So conscience is probably, I've been suggesting, over on the emotional side of our being rather than the cognition side of our being. However, uh, the, the rest part of this is where the gospel comes in. So uh, after talking about conscience that way, I also pointed out after my little study in there that we can talk about either a religious or a non-religious approach to that unsettledness and angst. And I use Augustine as an example of the religious approach. Only Christ will solve that. And I critique the non-religious approach of Jean Paul Sartre. So I, I realize this won't be everybody's cup of tea. The name of the book is Wednesday's Child. It has a suitably daunting and boring academic subtitle also. Um, I won't put you to sleep with that right now. But Wednesday's Child and Schultz, you can find that if you're interested. So you, you gave me a perfectly wonderful question for us to talk about, and I just tried to sell a book. That's what just happened. Yeah, yeah. It's also available as a Kindle, by the way. But um, see if... You, if if it sounds like you'd be interested to check this out, um, please please feel free and encourage. Page 10, nerds. So we are uh, continuing our emphasis on language. The two texts that I have for you this morning, one of them comes from Ludwig Wittgenstein. That's the first one on page 10. 
I'll explain a bit about him and why this is such a brief text, actually. And then the last one that I'm kind of pushing a little bit toward is, is a perfectly dreadful text from a perfectly dreadful philosopher, Jacques Derrida, so that we can um, test out what we've been talking about as logos from scripture and also incidentally from the Western tradition against this postmodern acid attack. Right. Okay. So Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, Wittgenstein died in the 1950s. So you'll notice that we've moved right along and we're very close to our own day. Truth be told in philosophy, um, wheels are falling off of philosophy today too, like other disciplines in the university. But in philosophy, we're, we're generally very circumspect, even hesitant to say things like, this person is the most important philosopher of the century. We usually wait until after a couple hundred years to let those assessments be done. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, uh, this may surprise you, but I think that Ludwig Wittgenstein is one of the two or three most important 20th century philosophers. Uh, Wittgenstein was a tortured soul. So if you're doing some checking up on his life story online, uh, depending on where your search engine dumps you first, you may actually run into some defenses of homosexuality based on Ludwig Wittgenstein's life or writings. Um, I, th I think it's quite likely that he was tortured by what we glibly call today same-sex attraction. But I'm not at all sure that it's clear that he gave in to the temptation. That's really neither here nor there for his, um, for his thinking. But I thought I'd mention it so you didn't get distracted and wonder why in the world I was recommending a pro-homosexual philosopher. I don't agree that he was. I don't think there's evidence for that, but certainly people with agendas glom onto that sort of thing. So I'm gonna say he was a tortured soul. Um, I'm not interested in pushing the fact that, that he was a Christian uh, but I, I would say two things. First, uh, when he died of cancer, uh, he was very interested in having last rites, and he had expressed that kind of desire along the way, though I don't think, from what I read of his life, I don't think that he was somebody who went to Mass every Sunday or something like that. Also, um, there's been a lot of misuse made of him in theology. For instance, his depiction of language as a game, and then uh, theologians, some among us too, just get get all in a in a tizzy, thinking that he's denigrating language, but actually he's talking about no. Just like you don't know chess unless you play chess, you can't sit back and make pronouncements about language unless you're immersed in language. All right, um, and then uh, finally. It is also the case that Wittgenstein is developing, as we all do, developing his thinking and believing and so forth during his career. However, near the end of his career, when he was teaching for a second time in Cambridge, this was right after World War II, Wittgenstein was, I suppose, either imitated or nearly idolized by a lot of the graduate students. So what we do have is we've got some little snippets. So for instance, this was really terrible in, in England right after World War II. You know, the rationing didn't end. Supplies were right. way down. So we, we happen to know that he would always bring his lunch <laughs> along in a potato sack. And guess what happened? Everybody, all of the graduate students, were, took to bringing their lunch in potato sacks. So, I mean, th this is, he's a, somehow, he's a cool guy on campus. Now, I love that because I think that's just about the only philosopher I can say that about, uh, oneself included. All right, so he was a cool guy on campus. And then what happens is this. When you're reading him, um, there are, there's only one book that was actually published during his lifetime. It's the one I'm going to excerpt one sentence from in a second. Another book that he's very famous for, and it's it's an extremely important read for those of us paying attention to language, is Philosophical Investigations. I also would admit that that's quite a challenging book. It's a little bit more like a Zen exercise on think this way, and then, oh, no, that doesn't work. Try this, and no. Um, some pretty successful explanations of his book have talked about him as being more Zen than philosophical in his methodology. 
Um, and then after that, the writings we have from him are a combination of books put together from boxes of notes that he had under his bed. In fact, investigations is mostly that, actually. Two, things that his students took down in class or took down while they were following him around campus and they were talking about things. So one of those conversations, just for a quick example, was, um, Professor Wittgenstein, do you believe in Judgment Day? And Wittgenstein said, well, do you people believe in Judgment Day? And they said, yes, we do. And he said, what does that mean? And they, they explained, I assume, some usual stuff. But he said, well, when, when I say explain it, I mean, what difference does it make in your life? Mm. Now, you can hear the teaching going on there. So instead of just saying, well, I'm a Christian too, which is not really very conversational. He, he does this kind of teaching thing. And I have the feeling he was also thinking this along with the students, very Socratic, right? So he's really not sure himself. The way to do this is to engage in conversation and thoughtful talk for a better understanding of the truth. Um, and he gets taken to task for not saying right away that I am a Christian who believes in Judgment Day, of course. So, all right, so Tractatus. Tractatus is a very brief little book. It's um, also a power-packed little book, and it's frequently misunderstood. So I can't, I can't pretend to um, pull all of this stuff apart and do a faithful job of teaching this to you. I want to mention, I do have some stuff up as kind of an introduction to Tractatus on LutheranPhilosopher.com if you're interested. And I also uh, just want to say, I have also had the privilege of teaching this book quite a bit over the years, including... Uh, I had the privilege of being invited to lead the book, the year-long book study for a couple of years for the folks at Wittenberg Academy. So one of the books that we did for a whole year's worth of talks was Tractatus, and the teachers were absolutely thrilled. We had marvelous discussions about Christ the Logos and the gift of language, courtesy of Wittgenstein. Now, it's not that all of this is clear, but this is a very, what, pregnant book. So the short little book. Now, I'm just about all I'm going to be able to do today is mention the first sentence and the last sentence of this little book. And I, I'm going to say that this is a book that at Wittgenstein's death was described as a philosophical poem. Philosophical poem. In London, if people are saying that, that's high praise. And this would be poetry at its best where, I don't know about you, but for instance, um, when I'm reading people like Dylan Thomas, uh, you know, some of these uh, often mentioned poets, I frankly don't know which end is up and what's what exactly is going on. I need a lot of guidance for, but I have this sense, boy, if I could only get this straight or if I could only see what the center concern is here, I'm sure this would be helpful and worth some more discussion. I think a lot of people have that feeling with this book. So it is an experiment in language. Uh, I should mention this is not a majority opinion, but I'm very confident about it and glad to argue it. So it's a book about language. In the first phase of his life, Wittgenstein is thinking that language needs to be cleaned up by imposing logic, even mathematical logic, on top of it. He thinks language is kind of indefinite, a little too wishy-washy, because he's a, a, a friend of Bertrand Russell, if you know him. That's what these guys were doing. Later on in life, in philosophical investigations, he sees he has it just wrong. You have to play in language. You have to be doing language. And then you see that this mathematical precision is something less. And logic comes after language. It comes from language and is kind of a distilled business in it. But it doesn't, it shouldn't rule language. That's, that's just wrong. Uh, okay, so the first sentence is... The world is all that is the case. And the last sentence is the one that you see here. Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one should remain silent. Now, the, the, it's usually a mistake at the beginning that destroys your reading of a book or your understanding an issue, right? Uh, that's Aristotle, and Aquinas quoted this a few times too. A small mistake at the beginning leads to disaster at the end. So 
the first sentence is quite important. The world is all that is the case. Wittgenstein actually makes it quite clear that he's talking about the world understood according to the scientific method. And his experiment is to see if you limit yourself, if we limit ourselves just to what the scientific method would allow us to say, how does that work out? How does that affect real life? And then we see the last sentence here. I, I'm trying to make it clear that I'm adding, it's kind of like a kind of like an amplified Bible thing. I'm adding what comes from the context in the rest of, of the book. Whatever whereof one cannot speak scientifically, thereof one should remain silent scientifically. If we have the time and interest, and we may not have the time, we could talk about the logical positivists right about here, if that rings a bell for you. Uh, but I've, I'm going to show this with a metaphor instead. So what you see as a diagram here is uh, my way of illustrating first a metaphor that I found from Wittgenstein in some of his letters about Tractatus. And then I'm going to show how it's meant to be completed. And I'm going to make the case that that Wittgenstein is helping us with this business of Christ the Logos or the importance of the Word of God quite a bit if, if you are really understanding what he's up to. Um, also, Wittgenstein, just like with that question about Judgment Day, he's not, he doesn't think it's his job to teach doctrine. He's doing philosophy, right? His job is to help tie things to reality more. So in a way, he's checking out whether those students take their doctrine to life and whether they really believe it. And that's an important task. So he's doing a Socratic thing rather than doing a Luther thing, I suppose. Something like that. Okay. All right. So here's the, the diagram. Uh, this is, uh, I'll call this just for convenience, mapping the ocean by walking the island. And I sketched this out as best I could. So the frame on the left is what Wittgenstein actually does talk about in this explanation of Tractatus. And the right side is my application of this. So mapping the ocean by walking the island. You want to ask what, what's going on in that illustration. The ocean is God and the island is language. Okay. Now, in case of the Tractatus, it would particularly be language restricted to what the scientific method will allow you to do. So that means that you can only say what fits with the empirical scientific method and things that are beyond that you shouldn't talk about. However, there is something else that Wittgenstein mentions, and this is always the mark of genius, when somebody doesn't just stop at the easy, so we can't do this, and, and keeps looking at real life. He also says, there are things that can be said scientifically that should be said scientifically. If you can't say things scientifically, you should shut up about it scientifically, right? But he also says, there are these other things that show up. So they can't be covered in a scientifically limited language, but they do show up in life and they should be talked about is I, I think the implication there, but not science won't do it. Science is too restrictive. It's too nearsighted. It's good at what it does, but it doesn't cover the important stuff. And the things that show up but cannot be said scientifically in Tractatus are God, aesthetics, and ethics. So aesthetics would be the study of the good, the beautiful, and the true, or of beauty, and ethics, right? So God cannot be talked about scientifically. So in Walking the Island, it goes like this. Um, I'll tell this as quickly as I can, and you let me know if it's too fast. So you want to think about all of us, I suppose, human beings uh, stuck on an island. It can be a desert island or a jungle island, doesn't matter, but stuck on an island. What is an island? Island is a piece of land that's surrounded all the way, but it's completely surrounded by the ocean. So if you like, I think, I think this is, this could be kind of put in the framework of that series on TV a while ago, Lost. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of people who were on this island and they didn't know what was what. And then by the way, some really mysterious things were happening, but they didn't know what's what. So Jack, who's an MD, <laughs> because he was an MD, ended up being in charge of everybody, at least initially. So you've got all of these people. Some of them are bandaged up. The, the plane is burning in the background over on the you know shore and partway into the ocean and bits of bodies and 
junk are floating around and these people have to figure out what's going on. So Jack gets everybody together, I'll say, in more or less the middle of the island. And he says, we got to figure out where we are before we, we know what we have to do. And so um, he sends people out in every direction. So he sends somebody over this way, somebody this way, somebody this way, somebody this way, somebody that way. Their direction is to walk out straight and then come back, right? So these people follow the directions. Part of Jack's genius is he gives them something to do when everybody's about to uh, jump off a cliff or something, right? They go out. And here's what happens when they come back to report. So one person comes back and says, I was able to walk two and a half miles that way, and I couldn't get any farther, so I came back. Somebody says, I got a half a mile that way, and then I came back. If you have enough people, what you'll do is you'll get a map of the island, right? So you'll, you'll find out where the boundaries are. Okay, let's hold on to that. Wittgenstein is actually talking that way throughout Tractatus. It, already in the, the preamble, he says that the purpose of this book is to draw a boundary or limit to thought, or rather to the expression of thought. It's language. In the case of Tractatus, technically it's only scientific language that you can use to do whatever mapping. But here, in this metaphor, it's language. All right, so can you, you got the picture okay? So you actually could get a picture of the island from inside. Now, remember, the task is mapping the ocean by walking the island. What do you know about the ocean from this process? And the answer is nothing. So the ocean is God. So in this setup, suppose that there were, there were some believers among the survivors on the island. If, if you just stick with the metaphor, they would not be able to say that they learned something about God, the ocean, by doing this. Also, the atheists who might be in that group of survivors could not say the ocean doesn't exist, God doesn't exist, because whereof you cannot speak, thereof you ought to shut the heck up, <laughs> right? You ought to shut up. I've often thought this would be a very good principle for faculty meetings, but that's another story. So, um, whereof you cannot speak scientifically, you must be quiet scientifically. Now, this is actually an answer to those logical positivists I mentioned who wanted to use science to determine what was real and what was imaginary. And because you couldn't get to God with science, their conclusion was he didn't exist. And Wittgenstein is saying, no, it just, it just proves you can't talk about God scientifically. Now, what I love about this is this looks like, you know, kind of a low and outside pitch that, that you're meant to swing at and put over the fence. Because the second, I should mention the second frame here is me. So what, what would change the situation here? If the ocean came onto the island, if the ocean came onto the island, I assume you would know the ocean is salty, rather wet, and overpowering if it did that. A tsunami, for instance. Um, back in the middle of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis used the notion of an invasion to talk about the incarnation. But I say, let's use tsunami here. So God comes onto the island in the person of Christ. And now, whatever he tells us in the domain of language, right? Whatever he tells us, we will know about the ocean that is about God. So I think that the setup here, the teeing up of this metaphor gives us the opportunity to say, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, right? What God has prepared for those who love him. But then here come the scriptures. Here comes Christ the word and his words onto the island. This is also my way of um, avoiding what's often referred to as natural knowledge of God, which I've got some questions on, but to, to show the certainty of knowledge of God through his word and through Christ language, logos. So the logos comes on to the island where the people have been created in such a way as to be using language. So since the water is coming down the island, if I get this home in front of well, you can now tell it to some respects what that water is. It's still confined by the landmass of the island. Uh, 
in that you yeah. can't get any new words, but you have a new understanding, so you're still, but you're still confined by that. Right. So, so the island is the environment of language. The, the really beneficial philosophers that we've had in the last couple hundred years were philosophers of boundaries. Kant actually does this somewhat too. Um, but Wittgenstein is doing this with the more primary thing, language. So then, then the thing would be something like this. Anything beyond language is beyond our experience. Right? So the amazing thing is the state of humiliation that Christ, the Logos, comes onto the island and expresses his heart teaches us what he's thinking and how he feels. And then I thought you were going to go a slightly different direction, and I, and I was nodding in anticipation, but therefore, what we do know about the ocean is only what the ocean himself has told us in the person of Christ. So there is a whole vastness that is simply not open to us and never will be. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay, or did you want to push that more? I mean, I'm just pushing it away. <laughs> I, I think of like the um old homilies and stuff where the church father is discussing initially how on how the language that he's using can never fully describe what he's trying to say, using what he's been given to try to describe. It. Yes, and they're not right. Well, I mean, yeah, if I'm going to say the church fathers are not right on that, those who speak in that way, you're going to want to check this out. But the, the reason for that is that, of course, Christ is telling us everything that is real that he wants us to know. And he's doing it in the absolutely dependable medium of his inspired word. Mm -hmm. There There is nothing left out. I think what's kicking around for that is something that we've regularized a bit today, too. So when I talked about people insisting that there are mysterious uh, mental processes that precede language, that, that go on without language. That's just guesswork. And it's guesswork based on, based on a lack of understanding of logos. So if, if a church father, or if you and I, you know, said something like, uh, so we're, we're, we're preaching on this, this text today, and here it is. And we said, well, you know, actually, these words just don't do justice to what God really means. That'd be horrible. Be absolutely horrible. It, it may be that our shallow understanding of some of these words or concepts in language are really poor, right? And the failure could lie there. But to infer ever that God's words are not adequate to what he wants to communicate to us, that's a kind of heresy. I also think it's a denial of um, Isaiah, right? So Isaiah 55 would be, I think, exactly uh, the right Isaiah passage for us when, when God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Can I point out the obvious? God is making that business clear to us in his words through Isaiah right here. Yeah? So it, it's it's kind of like a ne plus ultra. You Don't go here. There's no trespassing. You don't, you cannot set out and find out things about me that I haven't told you or wanted to tell you. Right? So it's that. And then may I just say, I'm, since I'm here, uh, the next couple verses, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That sure sounds like the genesis of this parable of the sower, doesn't it? So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. This is the efficacious character of God's word and of his every word. So anytime that, that we might um, allege or allow the thought to be that God's words 
or God's word is inadequate for the purpose, you want to run to Isaiah or, by the way, any section of scripture and see, well, they're not just adequate. They're absolutely fitted to what God wants us to know. It's, it's actually carrying his thoughts, the ones he wants to share, carrying those right into, into our hearts and minds and lives. Um, also, just on a far lesser point, um, I've, I've had uh, I've had this. Maybe you folks have given exams like this to or experienced exams. Um, I think essay exams are generally the way to go. So it's, uh, going around the class while they're writing, and and somebody says, "Oh, professor, I know what the answer to this question is, but I just can't put it into words." My dear student, it seems apparent you don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> um, let's talk about self-justification there too, by the way. So, right? So this is exactly what Wittgenstein talked about in that intro to Tractatus, to show the limits of thought, or rather of the expression of thought. Thought is confined to the realm of language. Logos. Uh, a question. So, how do you deal with somebody like uh, uh, someone who's born deaf? Yes, because they're going to pick up sign language eventually, but not initially. Yeah, some of us were having conversations along this very line outside of classes yesterday and a little bit on Monday. So, um, my my short answer is: sign language is language, right? I think you we were saying that. And uh, we could ask generally, well, what about before people are able to use language or if they're disabled because they're disabled from using language, right? Well, the first thing that, that I want to say here, because I'm, I'm really concerned about the, the automatic dehumanizing of people with disabilities or children who don't manifest, you know, all of these capacities. Uh, so... A human being is a human being, even if, I don't know, like for me, suppose um, suppose I were suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's like my dad did before his death. Even if I, I lose that capacity to communicate, I remain a human being and in God's care. And so to say that we are logos beings is not something that's done by the investigation of individual characteristics, and then you come up with a summation but this is an essential definition. So that child in the womb is a logos being. Um, the, the beloved person that we're, we're serving, you know, is maybe our parents or our uh, parishioners who are afflicted with Alzheimer's or massive brain injuries, right? They remain logos beings. Um, so uh, another piece of this is to realize that we can actually hamper the normal development of the human beings as they're created by depriving them of language. So this was referred to back in the day as feral children, children who grew up without human beings around to be talking with them. We today would probably call these ch abused children who are locked away from any interaction with other human beings at a young age. We do know, uh, this is accepted uh, neurology, anybody correct me if you'd like to, it's accepted neurology that um, during a certain stage of brain development, so we're talking young child into your teens, if you don't have interaction, linguistic interaction with people, if people aren't talking to you, with you, around you, you reach a point where you can't ever learn language no matter what after that. It has something to do with brain structure that can actually be observed. But it, it has to do, I think, fundamentally with the, um, the brain-mind connection and the neuroscientists noticed the failure of parts of the brain to develop, whereas we would notice the impossibility of learning. But the takeaway is we were created to grow up growing into Lugus, to have Lugus as the air to breathe in and breathe out as we're growing up. Now, again, those folks are not disqualified from being human beings created and redeemed by God and meant for heaven baptized human beings to be sure we're always careful to do that uh, but then uh, I don't I know that may not be hitting your your question straight 
Okay. So that's kind of an evidentiary thing of talking about that. By the way, um, Noam Chomsky uh, yeah. you know, was uh, proposed that we are born wired, if you will, for every language. Mm -hmm. And that in the course of early childhood, various parts of the wiring that aren't being used die out. Yes. And that, so the, if you, as you grow older, you got to the neurons, so you lose neurons in your brain. So the idea, and, and certain paths become more reinforced and others don't. And that's why as we get older, we become more set in our ways. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if that's, so if you were, were to deprive somebody of that language early on, basically all the language neurons get pruned. Yes. So I, I only know enough neuroscience to be dangerous and sometimes distracting, but the, uh, you know, the, tucked in there is this uh, mistaken doctrine that neurons, once they die, cannot be revivified. And we know today that that's not true. So, um, I, and also, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on Chomsky. He actually is, I think, a, the most familiar name when we think of linguists. And if you talk with professional linguists about it, uh, they, they talk about him as if he were the Kardashian of linguistics. He, he is all I met him. And Did you? Yeah. He is a weird guy. <laughs> very, very difficult person. Popular because he's popular. By the way, he was also a co-author of that article I referenced in passing um, where, where the scientists were saying there is no way that language is ever going to be explainable on the evolutionary hypothesis. Chomsky was one of the people in that list. So let's take one more, and then I'm, I'm going to impose a break. And we'll come back. So going with the death, those who have isolated. Yes. So the one, I think at one concept you could say, oh, well, language requires senses. However, then I'm thinking you can have a gorilla supposedly, I'm not fully convinced, but they they do this minor language where it appears that they're doing language. However, they have a huge deficit where they can never imagine what's not right in front of them. Yes. And so, but that being said, there's a surface level, I guess, of a basic thing of, oh, I don't see something at bars. So it's sort of communicating just based off senses, but I can't imagine using that word loosely something that it can't put itself in a place that it's never seen which is something that our language can do almost like an empathy of i can talk in a way that's completely abstract and that that's showing something deeper because it's not based off any of my senses mm -hmm. so that even though the blind man can't really talk about colors he he understands something still abstract that is confusing mm -hmm. for the language especially for those who are going beyond uh, what's it our only basing senses scientifically is that the language itself seems to not have a sense a physical sense it's something deeper yes or greater or however you want to describe it even though we use sensitive to describe it. Yeah, we don't use our senses to describe language too much, do we? We just do it. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm, yeah, thanks. So what I'm doing is in, is in our thinking about this is I'm, I'm offering the argument that there isn't anything deeper. And what you're actually doing is you're talking about the neurological or physical harm that might hamper language, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. No, but the, there's something beyond that. What what people will confuse as language, there's something. Some capacity. Yeah, so that even those, what is it, in Africa, I think it was Africa, there's people who were deaf, but they had no sign language, and they just developed their own language. Okay, but that they develop language is all I need for our conversation. So it wasn't that they created it, but that's their logos being. So this is going to come out barring profound um, brain injury or lack of development. So are you saying language then is deeper than just the mechanics of 
making sounds or signs. Or it's just senses like or like, like, or be like I'm or sensory. I want sensory. banana. I want this. Oh sure. Oh yeah, then that just I want to say a big loud yes because um I suggested in some of our conversations here and there yesterday, we were talking about the possibility of animals who might have been taught sign language like Coco the primate. Um, it's not actually language. Yeah, that's why I'm getting yeah, it. You know, right. And I get that you're saying that. And so I was going to say, and another way to identify that is there's no syntax and grammar going on. There's just a kind of stimulus response in a certain way. Okay, so I'm going to bring that to a close right now. Thanks. Is that okay? So then what we actually have is this um, interesting recognition from Wittgenstein that it just may be that to speak scientifically is not something that even science, with its efforts to restrict language to a certain kind of empirical evidence and method, that's something that science cannot actually accomplish. Witness the Tractatus. So he's endeavoring to talk about scientific language and what shows up beyond scientific language. The fact that all that's going on shows that language restricted, um, the restriction of language does not delete or overwrite language. So if you want to look for a little philosophical hope in there, that's a pretty strong argument. Okay, so I'm also going to add uh, Jacques Derrida, but first we're going to take a seven and one half minute break. Mm -hmm.